Well, it's my great pleasure this morning to welcome Director General Roberto Acevedo to the Peterson Institute. Following a distinguished career, which included an early stint here in Washington um, at the Brazilian Embassy, he was elected in May 2013 to succeed Pascal Lamy. Uh, Ambassador Acevedo became the ninth Director General of the GATT WTO system in September 2013. As everyone in this room knows, all three of the Bretton Woods institutions have uh, had troubles during the past decade, but none has faced greater troubles than the World Trade Organization. Uh, when <clears throat> Roberto took office, the Doha Round had stumbled for almost 12 years and he faced the immense challenge of rescuing uh, the WTO from irrelevance. The rescue vehicle uh, was to secure appro approval from about 159 contentious members for the trade facilit facilitation agreement, and uh, Roberto was captain of that rescue, uh, succeeding at the 11th hour and the 59th minute at the Bali Ministerial in December 2013, just three months after he took office. Uh, that was a dramatic moment. Now uh, the Director General faces uh, at least two new and large challenges. Uh, first, he must show skeptics, of which there are many, that the WTO is truly in business by delivering some agreements at the Nairobi Ministerial in December 2013, just a few months away. And second, he must persuade the members of this, now I think it's 161 uh, members, to chart a course for the WTO that ensures its vitality in a world of competing mega-regional PACs and that vitality for the next 20 years. So, Director General, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Gary, uh, for the kind words. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it, is, it is really a great pleasure uh, to be here again uh, in Washington. Um, it's a city that brings me memories of a, of a different moment in my life as well. Uh, and I want to thank uh, our friends here at the Peterson Institute for organizing uh, this event. And uh, what I'm going to say to you at this point in time is just a, uh, an appetizer, I think, for the Q&A uh, session. So take it as that. I don't want to be talking too long about things you don't want to hear. Um, but I think it will be probably food for thought. Uh, so let me go back a little bit to 1995. At that point in time, 128 uh, governments uh, came together to create a global organization uh, to govern trade. And so we're now 20 years later, uh, and I think it's a good time, I think, to assess uh, the progress that we have done over these 20 years and to think a little bit about what the future may hold. Now, the U.S., of course, has played a very important role throughout the history of the uh, multilateral trading system. And I don't have to tell you that this leadership is going to be critical for the, for the future steps that we have ahead of us. But uh, despite this, uh, often uh, when um, I hear about the debates about trade here in Washington, uh, the WTO and the multilateral trading system do not have a very high profile, as you can imagine. Uh, you're more likely to hear about TPP or TTIP or some other initiatives, but no, the multilateral system is not quite there. And frankly, that's no surprise. Um, the WTO has faced uh, big challenges uh, ahead of us um, over the last uh, 20 years, and some of those have shaken the faith uh, on this system. So the slow progress of the Doha Round is clearly an obvious background for all those conversations. So people think about that and they discourage us talking about the WTO a little bit, and there is no denying this. Um, but um, I will come back to the negotiating function of the WTO in a moment. 
But it is important that we remember that the WTO is much more than its negotiating function. So the organization um, is, is much broader, and I think that uh, we should also remember uh, that the, the, the very significant contribution that the WTO has given to global economic governance. So trade is now governed by a very robust organization, institution, uh, with much broader scope uh, than in the GATT years, uh, and it is backed up by a fully functioning, automatic and mandatory dispute settlement system. And as a result, uh, the cause of a liberalized, uh, inclusive, rules-based uh, international trade has, has been advanced quite significantly. And in these uh, two decades, uh, 33 new members joined the WTO, including big ones like uh, China and Russia. Uh, so today, the WTO covers uh, over 98% of world trade. Now, it is no coincidence that over this period, uh, average tariffs have fallen uh, by half. So the applied tariffs um, in 1995 uh, averaged around 15%, now they are at about 8%. Now trade volumes uh, have also doubled, more than doubled over that period. And in addition to that, I think uh, social issues have also uh, come to the fore. Uh, the impact of trade policy on people's lives um, is something which is always uh, on the minds of uh, the administration in the WTO, clearly on my mind. Uh, largely because it can be a very powerful tool uh, to fight poverty uh, globally. So the new Sustainable Development Goals, which are going to be agreeing in New York uh, this week, uh, are a reminder of this, uh, and they place a very significant emphasis on the role that trade can play in this regard. And of course, uh, the visit of the Pope here in Washington is something that always brings us to, to debt, um, His Holiness has delivered uh, very important messages uh, on the role of multilateralism, specifically about the WTO, um, in providing an equitable trading system uh, that supports uh, small and poor countries. Now, I think that the debate at the WTO now uh, puts much more emphasis uh, on these very important issues. And of course, uh, the voices of the least developed countries and of developing countries in general are much more heard than they ever were before. Um, it is also uh, worth remembering that much of the day-to-day -day work of the organization in Geneva goes unseen. Uh, um, but nonetheless, that day-to-day -day routine work is extremely important. It is vital in administering um, the global trading system and keeping uh, commerce flowing. On a daily basis, uh, the WTO members monitor each other, uh, they monitor each other's practices and regulations and ensure that the agreements are being observed. Um, the regular activities of the WTO commitments and the WTO bodies in general uh, enable members to exchange information, uh, raise concerns and suggest new approaches on a wide range of issues. Um, they deal with all sorts of things of real life. For example, um, the use of chemicals in toys, or the use of uh, toxins in, in food, um, labeling of products, whether they are adequate or not, um, whether they actually inform the consumer, or whether they have a protectionist uh, intent. Um, so there are hundreds of issues which are raised in the WTO every single year. Um, more than that, we have also our regular uh, monitoring exercise where we look at the practices and the measures which are adopted um, in countries uh, to help to improve the transparency of the exercise of the practices and to avoid protectionism. Uh, in this way, I think that the system helped uh, to avoid an outbreak of protectionism right after the crisis. Uh, and we have actually stepped up this monitoring exercise uh, after that. Now, our latest report uh, shows that trade protectionism uh, remains of concern to the global economy. But there, has, there have also been some positive signs, uh, some positive news, for example, uh, in showing that the number of trade liberalizing measures um, has also been improving. Now, of course, when disagreements happen, and they do, uh, 
uh, in these monitoring activities, the WTO offers a platform uh, for dialogue which very often uh, results in mutually acceptable understandings. Um, but if those conversations prove to be, or those differences prove to be unbridgeable, uh, we offer a dispute settlement mechanism that has a very solid and impressive uh, track record uh, in the, on the international stage. In just 20 years, we dealt with almost 500 trade disputes, uh, helping members to settle their differences in a very transparent and legal fashion. Um, in just 20 years, we have successfully dealt uh, with approximately more than 90% of those uh, disputes. They have been actually resolved. This is a, a phenomenal level of demand. Um, it has put pressure on the dispute settlement system because those cases are coming, they keep coming, and they're coming more and more frequently, precisely because the system works. It, it's, a, it's proof of the success of the system. Now, uh, the topics also, and this is very important, people only look at ah, the number of disputes, members are using the system, but they don't often look at what we are discussing, what we are uh, um, looking at when we are handling these disputes. So recent disputes, for example, they touch upon issues like um, trade and renewable energy, uh, policies to discourage uh, tobacco consumption, uh, packaging information for consumers, uh, preservation and management of exhaustible resources, um, and many other issues which are critical in today's world. Now, in this way, just through the dispute settlement um, uh, arm, um, we are somehow updating the system. It updates incrementally, but it is continuously being updated. So, uh, when they also, and this is important, that uh, uh, we, we, we recognize that the bulk of the WTO agreements, they are about 20 years old. Now, we cannot forget that. So, when the members agreed to them uh, in 1995, so about 20 years ago, and on the legal text themselves, and that goes even before that, it goes before to the GATT years, um, they provided uh, the world uh, with a kind of a constitution for trade, with basic principles, principles like um, non-discrimination or national treatment. And these principles are perennial. They, they withstand the test of time. They will never go away, and we are perfecting over those uh, uh, um, uh, principles. But of course, we need to negotiate new rules, especially where you need to improve the clarity in some areas where we have no, where we have no rules at all. Uh, so it is uh, important that we also do that. Um, but our uh, underperformance, I think, on the under the uh, negotiating front, it has become uh, the Achilles heel of the organization, especially as far as public perception is concerned. So, of course, there has been uh, some real negotiating successes under the WTO over the past uh, 20 years. We did negotiate uh, new agreements and improvements in telecommunications, in financial services, in, um, in government procurement. Um, in fact, we had a major breakthrough in the expansion of the information technology uh, agreement uh, this July. Um, and this is the first tariff cutting deal that we have in the WTO uh, in the 18 years of its existence. And it's a big one. Uh, it will eliminate tariffs over 200 IT products. Uh, and trading those products uh, are worth uh, above $1.3 trillion per year. So that means that the deal will eliminate uh, uh, tariffs over approximately 7% of global trade. Um, these are incredibly um, significant numbers, uh, but we also have delivered multilaterally. So some of those, all of those um, things that I mentioned, they were uh, mostly uh, plurilateral, but we did negotiate multilateral deals like the Bali package um, a couple of years ago, which included the trade facilitation agreement. Um, again, um, this will deliver real economic benefits. Uh, it's not uh, a minor agreement. Uh, it will boost um, up to $1 trillion each year to the global economy. It will provide that kind of boost. Uh, and once, of course, the agreement is implemented. So some promising and auspicious uh, uh, steps have been taken. 
but clearly we need to deliver more and we need to deliver more quickly. Um, and we cannot at the same time naively, I think, expect that uh, negotiations in market access will move as fast multilaterally as they do um, regionally or plurilaterally. Um, this has never been the case uh, since the inception of the system. It's not going to change. That's just the reality of life. Now, this is clearly illustrated by the emergence of the um, mega regional agreements uh, like uh, TTIP, uh, TPP, um, and we, of course, must consider uh, how these agreements impact on WTO rules uh, uh, in particular. Not so concerned about market access, but in the rules side. Uh, and this is something that uh, the G20 has actually asked us, uh, the WTO, to, to take a detailed look at that. Um, what um, we have found so far in this examination, which was requested by the leaders, is that uh, the WTO rules provide the basis uh, for many RTAs. Uh, the RTAs uh, that deal with issues which are covered in the multilateral disciplines, by the multilateral disciplines, uh, those disciplines are maintained. So you, essentially what they do is they keep the WTO disciplines. Sometimes they adjust and they top it up a little bit, but mostly it is the WTO disciplines that stay there. So this is clearly the case, for example, in anti-dumping uh, provisions, uh, safeguards, um, technical barriers to trade, sanitary and phytosanitary measures, uh, rules of origin and services, all those things, they're essentially building on the WTO rules. Um, however, uh, the RTAs also go beyond the WTO rules sometimes, and we need to think about the implication of this uh, into the future. Uh, a proliferation of very different and conflicting sometimes standards would be more of a drag on business instead of facilitating business, and uh, so this is an important area that we need to work uh, on us in the WTO and you on this side. So um, we shouldn't, however, overstate this issue. The multilateral system has always coexisted with regional and bilateral deals and proved to be uh, those two tracks mutually reinforcing. So there are uh, many issues in which the RTAs, for example, cannot properly or fully um, uh, address. I don't have to remind you of agricultural subsidies, even fish subsidies, although they are being handled somewhat, but properly and truly effectively handling that, it, you have to do it multilaterally. Now, this puts the spotlight back on the WTO and our capacity to negotiate. Let me talk then a little bit about the future of the negotiations, and we need to have a very honest look uh, at the current situation. Uh, right now, we're working very hard to deliver meaningful outcomes uh, in our ministerial conference in Nairobi in December. This is the first time that we're holding this meeting in, in Africa, so it's important that we deliver there. Um, but as things uh, stand today, uh, and of course this is not going to come as a surprise to you, um, it doesn't look like there will be uh, big breakthroughs in the areas that have been stalled uh, for so many years. Uh, such as domestic support in agriculture and market access in the three areas, in ag, NAMA, and, and, and services. So the gaps in these areas are still very big. Um, the situation may change, uh, but there are not very positive signs that this may happen um, now. Now, if there are no prospects for a major advance on these issues, uh, members uh, will need to face reality. Uh, they will need to think about what they want the WTO to be and how it should work in the future. Now, it is a very important debate. Uh, the paper uh, that you yourselves, the Peterson Institute, prepared earlier this year on the future of the WTO was a very welcome contribution to this discussion. Um, it is indeed a debate that is receiving attention at the highest level, at the highest political level at the Brisbane meeting uh, of the G20 last year. Uh, the leaders uh, themselves discussed uh, what can be done to make the international uh, trading system work better. Uh, and they are planning to go back to this in Turkey uh, when we meet uh, in November. And despite uh, the differences uh, on major issues, 
I think uh, that there is still a, a potential for a meaningful agreement in Nairobi, a clear potential for that. And um, indeed, I think that delivering a, a successful Nairobi meeting is perhaps the best thing that we can do uh, to make the system work better. Um, from the conversations uh, with, a right, with a very wide range of members uh, there in Geneva and groups of members, I believe that um, a set of deliverables uh, is possible for Nairobi. Um, and these include uh, uh, outcomes in export competition in agriculture, um, transparency provisions in many areas in different agreements, and also an LDC package and, um, and outcomes on special and differential treatment provisions. Um, and crucially, I think, there is a broad understanding that um, development will have to continue to be at the core. And I think that uh, the, the package for the LDCs is something that all members agree that uh, is an important component of whatever we do in Nairobi. So we must continue, of course, our efforts in domestic support and market access. It's they're difficult, but we cannot give up. Uh, but we also need to start uh, some serious work in the areas that are promising. But so far, we have been putting that uh, to a later stage. We're saying, let's, let's tackle the difficult things, and then we do work on, on the things that may be more promising. But I don't think that we can postpone that conversation anymore. Um, even those promising areas are going to be difficult. So we have to start working on that. Um, I think if we look back at our history, we see that there are things that we can do, that we can, that we can uh, uh, explore more. Um, and I think that any future approach that we have will have to be, I think, focusing on, on the alternatives that we have. And clearly, there are two alternatives ahead of us. Uh, one of us, and I would call it the first track, um, is where uh, all members are involved. So it's a truly multilateral track. Um, and in these cases, we're talking a bit about a very diverse group. We're now more than 160 members with all different orientations, economically, ideologically. Um, and, of course, this means that we can't have a very monolithic, rigid uh, outlook uh, when you are negotiating in that format. Uh, so I think, that's my opinion, that the days of the one-size-fits-all uh, are gone. That just won't happen anymore, not in the WTO. It may have worked in the GATT sometimes, but I don't think in the WTO it's going to happen. Now, we need to have um, flexibilities uh, in, inbuilt in the agreements, uh, which allow members uh, to take on the obligations uh, at an appropriate pace according to their capabilities uh, and providing also assistance to help them to implement the provisions. In Bali, and I think especially the, the, the trade facilitation agreement, uh, provides us precisely uh, this kind of, of template. Now, there is uh, a, a new attitude to the way that we look at the negotiations, um, and it, I think, proved that we can find common ground if we insert the right flexibilities in a multilateral agreement. So this is food for thought. Think about that. Uh, the second track is to advance negotiations uh, in, um, in, in negotiations that embodies uh, less than the full membership. So a, a plurilateral uh, track. Um, and these kind of approaches have provided uh, a very important avenue, I think, uh, for groups of members to tackle uh, some specific issues which were very important to them. Um, and this is the format that we, we know how to work with this format. We've done this before. Um, and we've had many achievements uh, following this track. Uh, just recently, I mentioned the Information Technology Agreement. This is what uh, we, we managed to do in July. Um, this was also, this is, is also the template that we're looking to use for the Environmental Goods Agreement, which is also a potential deliverable in the near future. But of course, um, if you do go down this track, then you can be more rigid, more demanding, more one-size-fits-all. But clearly, you're not going to have all WTO uh, members in it. You have those that can live with, uh, with that rigidity and with that inflexibility. Um, so this is an, an obvious uh, uh, approach. We have done it before. And it is easier uh, to uh, 
put these kind of uh, plurilateral agreements under the WTO umbrella if the benefits that are negotiated there are extended to all members. Now, we have at least then two possible ways to explore, so the multilateral, the plurilateral, and I myself don't exclude hybrid approaches where you have a little bit of both under the same uh, track. So of course, um, uh, major trade rounds like the Doha round or the Uruguay round, they are important, uh, but I think we cannot limit the system uh, to negotiations only in those uh, formats. So when progress is more difficult, I think we need to use the full range of tools that are available to us. So we need to be innovative and to keep an open mind on how we negotiate. Now, the question that you posed in the title of the event today is what are the future prospects for, the global, for global cooperation in trade? Now, and I think that the answer, based on the WTO's track record of the last 20 years, is that the prospects in most areas are encouraging. Uh, indeed, I'm very positive about the future of the organization. I certainly do not agree with some of the um, uh, doomsayers uh, who say that our best days are over. I think it's quite the opposite, actually. Um, today, the WTO is, is firmly uh, uh, established as a component of global governance. Um, the rule of law in trade is spread uh, wider uh, than ever before. Now, the daily work of administering the system and monitoring trade policies and settling disputes provides an invaluable framework for members. I have no doubts about that at all. So yes, we do need to look at how we can restore the negotiating function I think, uh, to a more positive footing. But I think that we made a pretty good start in Bali, again in July this year. Um, while I would not deny, uh, under any circumstances, uh, that we face real challenges, um, but if you do expect uh, to be a truly relevant institution uh, for global governance, uh, the challenges and the stakes are always going to be very high. If you want to be relevant, right? If you want to do things that don't matter, then it's easier and the challenges are much more um, uh, manageable. So our record in recent years shows that we can deliver, that we can do so in a variety of ways. We need to use them all. Um, we should not uh, lose sight of these successful um, um, accomplishments. Uh, we must build on them precisely to deliver more. And um, there are some clear next steps ahead of us. I think uh, it starts with delivering on the expanded ITA. I think that's a clear uh, st step that we need to take in the short term. Uh, implementing trade, the trade facilitation agreement and all the other Bali outcomes. Um, pushing forward the negotiations on environmental goods. Uh, and most important, also delivering important outcomes in Nairobi. So in fulfilling uh, this mission. I think that uh, your involvement and your contributions, like the one you gave this year, are very important. We do follow them. Uh, we, I have to say that uh, some look uh, interesting, others look pretty impossible, uh, but that's okay. That's, that's the way that the debate uh, should, should, should happen. Um, and we continue to rely on your support and your engagement on your attention and your input. Um, and uh, this is a dialogue that I think uh, is a win for, for everybody. Uh, so thank you all very much uh, for listening, and I'm going to try to respond and interact with you in a, in a productive way. Thank you. Well, Ambassador and Director General, that was a terrific set of remarks. Now, usually the people who are sitting in my place, they start off by asking you a few questions, easy or hard. We have in this room 
uh, many, maybe most, of the best trade minds in Washington. And therefore, I'm going to forego my opportunity to toss some questions at you. I have a lot that I could do. But I'm going to invite immediately, as our time is quite limited, the Director General has to uh, go on <laughs> to another very busy appointment in just 25 minutes. So please, come forward. Anybody who has a question? Yeah, we have one person there. And please introduce yourself, and let's Hi. go. Can you hear me? OK. Uh, I'm Kim Frankena. I'm with the Government Accountability Office. I wanted to ask about what specifically you think the United States could be you know, particularly proactive on in the coming months to make Nairobi a successful meeting. Oh, so many things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure they would agree with me, though. Uh, but look, I think um, the US clearly um, is, is a key player uh, in, this, in, this, in this endeavor, a key piece of the puzzle. So without that piece, the puzzle doesn't ever complete itself. Um, but um, I think the conflict that we see today in the WTO is the different perspectives that you see among the key players. Uh, and you, you, you would say, um, like many others probably, that uh, the problem with the WTO is that it's too big now. It's 160 members, whatever it is. And I, and I often say that that's not true. The problem with the WTO is not the size of the organization. If we were just six, we would still have no agreement. If we were four, maybe not. Maybe two. You would still have no agreement. Um, and the problem that I see today is that, frankly, for Nairobi, it's not about the economics. Okay, it's, it's not about the effort, the economic effort, or the economic impact that what we have on the table is going to have on the different players, especially on the key players. It's about the politics of it. It's about the, the, the visibility of what is happening, uh, whether the efforts are proportional, whether uh, the, the, let's say, the subsidizers are contributing in a proportional manner. It's not about it's something impossible for me to do. Nobody, nobody's being asked in the WTO to do the impossible. No one at this point in time is being asked to do the impossible. Everybody's being asked to contribute with whatever they can. But some are saying, um, oh, all right, I can do this, but I won't do this unless that other guy over there puts something on the table. And the other guy is essentially saying, well, why? I have already put everything on the table. I don't have anything else in my pockets to put on the table. Actually, I do, but it's not fair that I have to put some more on the table. I think that in this kind of environment, we're all missing the big picture. We're all missing the picture that even if the proportionality, the perfect proportionality is not there, if we want, if we treasure the system, if we want to do more with it, if we want to contribute more, if we want to have more things being delivered, you have to do sometimes an effort also on the political sphere. And I'm not here saying that the US is the problem. I'm saying that everyone, all of them, have to have this bigger picture. This is precisely what we need to do when uh, we get, um, I think uh, now in Istanbul, I think the, the, the seven members that have been meeting more frequently are going to meet at the ministerial level. I hope that they will have precisely this kind of conversation. And, uh, and maybe later on uh, in Istanbul, um, and hopefully by Nairobi, we would have uh, a common understanding amongst them that they all need to forget a little bit about uh, how good or how bad this is going to look, and think a little bit more about, um, about the system. Uh, because I, I don't see, frankly, at this point in time, anything that is undoable uh, being requested from anyone. Thank you. Jeff Schott, and then John. 
uh, Jeff Schott with the Peterson Institute. Uh, let me just follow up on that because uh, in a negotiation, it's not just everyone giving at the same time, but you some can give now, like the major countries, and some can give later. Uh, and indeed, if there was commitments by some of some of the uh, 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 major developing countries in the WTO to commit to a post-Nairobi uh, negotiating agenda, it, it might be possible. Uh, if, if you and, and Mike Froman could work uh, miracles in Bali, perhaps <laughs> you can also do it uh, this year as well. And I think you two were the most important and deserve the most credit for that, uh, that success. Uh, but let me ask you a specific question on post Bali, and that would be in the area of investment. Investment was taken off the Doha Round agenda in Cancun at the Ministerial in September 2003. And yet many of the countries that objected to negotiating investment rules in the WTO are actively working in uh, uh, free trade agreements in mega regionals uh, to sign on to very comprehensive investment rules in those important agreements. It would seem that uh, that would be an avenue for finding a broader support to move that important issue back into the WTO agenda in the future, perhaps starting with a investment facilitation or framework agreement. And I wondered if you had some comments on, uh, on okay. that. Okay, uh, as people are lining up, let's get John Lipsy's question as well. And then uh, we've got others lining in the background there. Yes. Thank you. Uh, well, this Billy built on, on the, the, what Gary just said. The, uh, I was intrigued at the, your uh, suggestion of a plurilateral approach. And uh, the IMF did try this through the multilateral uh, negotiations on global imbalances with the idea that the general membership authorized a negotiation among a subset of the members to reach an agreement that then would be potentially approved by the general body. In the current context, that would mean, in other words, the WTO membership would authorize, for example, the TTIP. And therefore, rather than having uh, being an arbitrary grouping outside of the multilateral system, it would be an, potentially an example of your plurilateral approach. To make that work, however, requires the strong commitment of the major members. Is there any possibility of that happening, or are we just going to continue to see these, uh, these super regional or, or regional agreements off on their own with the members saying, well, someday maybe we'll get the rest of the WTO to come along? Director General? Um, well, I'll, I'll try to be quick because of the line that is growing <laughs> over there. Um, so on future commitments, and uh, I think that uh, from the emerging economies and others to make it possible, I think uh, we're open to that, definitely. Uh, I'm not sure how to do it, but I am very, very open-minded about any, anything that happens, that, that uh, may, 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 may make it happen. Um, on investments coming back, um, I think there is a lot of mistrust in the, in the, among the members about what exactly investments mean. Are we talking about trims, uh, an expansion of the trims, or, or something like that? Are we talking about, like you said, a facilitation framework for investments? I don't know. So we need to, first of all, uh, if we want to talk about um, these very important issues which are not on the agenda of the DDA today, uh, it will require some conversation among members to make sure that they, if we do that, we're not forgetting uh, the, the very important issues of domestic support, market access, and that they want to negotiate and continue to negotiate. Their fear is that if we move on and, and to incorporate other issues, that we are just sweeping those under the rug, and they will never accept that. How do you convince them that you can bring those things and still seriously be talking about these other non-delivered elements of the DDA, that's, that's the key part of the conversation. Um, on plurilaterals, yes, absolutely. Um, and I think that uh, we have in the rules already, uh, so we don't even have to negotiate that. It's already there. Uh, depending on the type of, of plurilateral, the road is different. 
So if it is a, a free trade agreement or a customs union, it's much easier. You don't have to ask for authorization or anything. It's automatically uh, uh, inserted. If it is negotiation of rules, um, then it's trickier. Uh, you may have it, but you need to change the, 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 um, the amend, you have to amend the agreement itself. And at that point in time, you need multilateral approval, but it's possible. Okay, Bill Reinch and Sean Donnelly. We'll take two. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Bill Reinch with the National Foreign Trade Council. It's nice to see you again. In your uh, opening remarks, you listed a number of WTO cases labeling uh, exhaustible resources, things like that, that seems to me move the WTO and the trading system into some new areas uh, because you're really being asked to rule on government's health policy, environmental policy, consumer protection policies, things that are not traditional trade issues, number one, and number two, I think in the minds of governments, a lot closer to how they've chosen to organize their societies, and I think in their judgments, a little less susceptible to international review. Uh, I guess my question is, is uh, why do you think that's happening, and is this a good thing for the WTO, or is it going to make your job more difficult? Thanks, Mr. Director General. Uh, I'm Sean Donnelly from the U.S. Council for International Business. I wanted to talk about governance in the WTO. Um, it seems to me that all the international organizations are struggling uh, to figure out how to share power and bring the large emerging countries into a bigger role and, and so on like that. Um, how's that working at the, at the WTO and do all of these emerging countries that I hope are being given a larger role, do they fully understand with that leadership role comes a, a responsibility to help uh, show flexibility and really help find solutions, not just insist that as poor countries they just receive. So, thanks. Hi. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hi. No, why don't we hold off? I think two questions is enough per round. So. <laughs> Go ahead. I, th I, th I, th I would rather hear them all because there is okay, overlap sure. sometimes. Yeah. Hi. Brett Fortnum from Inside U.S. Trade. You've mentioned a potential deal on export competition, transparency issues, uh, and also an LDC package with special and differential treatment. Um, have you seen uh, any leniency from the U.S. or any flexibility that they might be able to go beyond their current commitments on export competition um, or commit to more rules on transparency than what's currently in place. Um, and from my understanding with the negotiations on the different uh, aspects of an LDC package, those are, those are also still very difficult um, and you know, e even LDC members are not necessarily agreeing on them. Uh, how do you see that moving forward as well? What, what as well? Uh, the, the LDC package and okay. also the special and differential treatment. Okay. Thank you. Okay, let's go with these. Bastis can have a big question. Hi. So now let's, now I want to hold you off, yep. Bob, okay. because <laughs> that's going to be a big one and I'm going to supplement it. So let's go with these three. <laughs> All right. Uh, so on DSU uh, and the WTO uh, ruling on things which are not necessarily, uh, according to the, the person who was asking the question, uh, um, uh, trade-related, like environmental policy or consumer protection policies and things like that, um, I disagree. I think they're essentially very, very trade-related. Uh, and there are agreements that cover that, that have been negotiated. So this is not a, an indirect way of handling things that should not be dealt with the WTO. They're squarely within the mandate of the WTO. Some less, some more, but clearly all of them are clearly um, uh, uh, under the mandate. Uh, if they were not, then the, the appellate body and the, and, the, and the panels would not touch them. So I think it's, um, so far I haven't heard from the members themselves, uh, no one saying that the WTO has been dealing or handling issues which should not be before them. I have um, heard uh, complaints of the members, and they always come, uh, that uh, uh, there was a misinterpretation of this, a misinterpretation of that, or that the appellate body went too far, 
in, in, but nobody ever said that this was outside the scope of the WTO. So I think um, consumer protection policy, that's absolutely within the mandate of the WTO, absolutely. Environmental uh, exhaust, uh, exhaustible resources uh, uh, and, and measure that tackles in, uh, exhaustive resources absolutely are within the, 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 the realm of the WTO disciplines, as long as it is handling the trade aspect of that. That's all. Um, and I think so far, uh, the, the, the findings of the appellate body and of the panels have been quite sound and, and well taken by the, even the environment, uh, 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 NGOs and, uh, and, uh, and um, institutions that handle those issues as well. So it's been, I think that they're doing a very good job at this point in time. On governance and the emerging economies, leadership versus responsibility. I think they all know uh, that, uh, you know, the big emerging economies are never going to be dealt with or perceived as uh, any other country. And they know that. So China, uh, India, Brazil, they, they understand that they are not going to be perceived or treated as you know, a small LDC or something. They know that and they, they understand that. They don't, they don't expect um, to, 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 they don't expect to be treated equally with all the other members, but they also don't expect, um, because it, people say Brazil, China, India, but there are many others, right? it's Turkey, Indonesia, uh, Korea. Uh, there are a number of other countries that uh, are essentially developing countries that understand that they are differentiated, but they would never accept to be uh, categorized in a different category. I think that's the problem that you have. Now, they will contribute, they will contribute proportionally, but they will never accept that they are developed. That's the other point. So it's one thing to say that you have to, to take more responsibility. It's another thing to say you are now one of the big players and just like the US or Japan or Germany, they will never accept that because they still face some very important social and economic challenges that still differentiates and still would classify them uh, as developing countries the way that they see it. So that, I think, is the, the major difference there. On the package for Nairobi, I think the U.S. is engaging uh, on, all the, on all the issues. And I don't think that the U.S. disagrees that those are potential deliverables, even the LDC package and the um, S&D uh, package. If you ask me, is the U.S. already then in agreement that the, on the contours and the substance of the package uh, together with the LDCs in the developing countries? No, clearly they are not. Uh, but they all want to deliver on those areas. The U.S. never said uh, that these areas are not potential deliverables. On the contrary, they are saying they think they are. Now, under what shape, what format, and how deep we can go, how fast, that's a different story. That's what we have to negotiate between now and December. <clears throat> that's it. Bob Bastine. Okay. Hi. Um, Bob Bastien, the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. Hi. And Mr. Services Trade. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> um, it's easy to say, and people do say, that the great curse of the WTO has been the Doha Round, Do Doha Round Declaration, and its unrealistic agenda built substantially around um, special and differential treatment, then further confused by the addition of well, the disappearance of the, of the group of four, the leadership core of the old WTO, the old uh, GATT, and, um, and, and, and the uh, proliferation of, of membership, um, and therefore a lack of consensus. And it sort of dismays me as, I've, as we've moved along through um, the final phases, shall we say, of the Doha round. The, I'm thinking about the, I think, the ministerial in 2010, where Finally, it was allowed that uh, um, countries could sue other alternatives, pursue other alternatives, and we got around to a TISA. Still, we are laboring with the uh, leftovers, shall we say, the ghost of the Doha round. Can we drive a stake in its heart and start all over? <laughs> well, I thought he was gonna ask a big question about services, so I'm gonna supplement with the services question. Um, which is that we know that the barriers to services trade 
are very high. We know that most of our economies, uh, more than 50% of all economies, are services. And uh, we think we know that if you're going to get trade growing faster than world GDP, where it's been growing slower than world GDP for the last eight years, that you really need to liberalize services trade a lot. So the question is, do you think TISA is going to deliver something truly meaningful in the next year? Why don't you take those two and then we're going to take <laughs> All right. Our distinguished so on those, on those two, uh, on whether or not we can drive a stake <laughs> at the heart <laughs> of the DDA, um, well, you can try. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure it's a vampire, and I'm not sure that that would do the trick. Um, look, I think members in general. If you, ask the, if, you, if you don't have an outcome that delivers on domestic support and market access, for example, in Nairobi, um, and if you ask members, uh, can we forget this? I don't think that you'll get an affirmative answer to that. Um, they will all say uh, that these are issues that will be important and that will continue to need uh, treatment somehow. The developing world is never, ever, going to rest and accept that they are not, uh, that they have to compete in agriculture against heavily subsidized products coming from developed countries. They will never accept that. They don't have, a, they don't have the tools today to avoid that. When they do, they, they act. They go to dispute settlement like Brazil did uh, against cotton, and others will if there is no other uh, alternative. But this issue is not going to disappear. They were never going to accept that, because particularly in industrial goods, uh, that doesn't exist, right? So they can't subsidize their, 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 their inefficient production to, to compete against uh, more efficient production coming from somewhere else. So the issue itself is not going to disappear. The question, I think, is under which framework are you going to continue to negotiate or talk about these issues? I think that is the question. And um, the reality is, if you know from the beginning that these issues are not going to be swept under the carpet, that they're going to still be there, then people are already preparing for that conversation. I mean, let's not be naive about that. It, put yourself in the place of a negotiator. You know that the export that, that, uh, that uh, subsidies, agricultural subsidies, are going to come back to the table at some point in time. It may not be tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, but at some point, it's going to come back. If I am that negotiator, I'm going to be preparing for that conversation today. And I will make sure that I have on the table all the elements and all the papers and all the history that backs my case. That's what the DDA is all about. It's not about whether people believe or do not believe that it's going to be done in the next few days or in the next few years. It is about setting the stage for the negotiations when they come. This is what it's about. And I think that uh, if you understand that, you'll have a different uh, focus, maybe on the question. But that's, that's my take. What do I know? You know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> TISA. Uh, TISA, uh, I don't know whether fortunately or unfortunately, uh, is not negotiated in the WTO. That's done completely outside the WTO. Um, I, I actually um, know what's happening because members are generous enough to tell me what's happening sometimes. Um, but I don't have the details of that. I don't follow that. It is done completely outside. The Secretariat is not involved. We don't provide any support. Zero. Um, what I can tell you, not to avoid the question completely, because that's not the intention. I'll be as, as transparent and honest as I possibly can in this format. Um, what I think is going to be a tough discussion is that a lot of the TISA uh, participants would like to see TISA 
as a platform for a multilateral understanding oh. or a platform for something that will happen and be brought into the WTO. And I think that they would, they have a, a certain reluctance in accepting to conclude a deal outside the WTO without knowing whether that those commitments are going to be brought inside the WTO. Why? Because they would like to see others contributing too. They're going to say, well, I'm doing this outside the WTO, that's fine, I agree on these, but look, if we are serious about this, then let's bring it to the WTO and see whether the others are going to chip in or something like that. That may be a, a trickier uh, exercise than if all of them were in full understanding and agreement that that's something to be self-contained and that uh, it's not going to have or need any kind of uh, contribution uh, or insertion in the structure of the WTO. I think, but I, again, I'm telling you from my personal perspective, because I don't negotiate CISA, what I'm telling you is essentially what I'm hearing from others. Maybe I misinterpreted, but um, that I think is a challenge. Now, not the only one, but clearly a challenge. Please. Thank you very much, Roberto. Welcome to DC. Thank you very much for your, sorry, David O'Sullivan, European Union Ambassador in, in Washington and a former trade negotiation, negotiator with Roberto in I'm driving a stake through the heart of the DDA. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if we have the silver bullet uh, capable of, uh, uh, I, and I agree entirely with your remarks. Thank you for your remarks. Thank you for the great leadership you've shown, the success in Valley, and we hope that you will be, have a, a similar success in Nairobi. Um, uh, th for those of us who care about trade, the vitality and success of the WTO is, is, remains absolutely fundamental and, and we will continue to support uh, everything that you are doing in this regard. I have a question as a former trade negotiator in Geneva, and I know it's a rather unfair question, but I'm going to put it anyway. In your description of uh, the negotiating function of the WTO, do you think there is any scope for revisiting the way those negotiations are conducted? I know the mantra, it's a member-driven organization, but given the diversity of the membership, given the complexities of these negotiations, is there not scope perhaps for thinking of a little more of a, a leadership or right of initiative role for the director general or for the chairs of the groups to try and take the process forward uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a more effective way? I, I, I know it will be controversial, but I sometimes wonder that we're so trapped in the, the actual working methods of the WTO that perhaps uh, these working methods are no longer adapted to the situation in which we now find ourselves. Thank you. And we'll have one more question. Krista Hughes from Reuters. Uh, the refugee crisis in Europe is putting a lot of pressure on the Schengen visa-free zone. Do you see any negative implications for trade if indeed the, the Schengen system crumbles? I, I couldn't hear you too well. Could you repeat that because it wasn't coming across clearly. The, the refugee crisis in Europe is putting a lot of pressure on the Schengen visa-free zone. Do you see any Im negative implications for trade if the Schengen system crumbles? Well, uh, Schengen by itself is a different, uh, and, and that I would say is a non-trade related issue. Uh, I, I think what I'm more concerned about is the integrity of the economic uh, 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 cooperation in Europe and, um, and, the, and the, the system of uh, trade, of, of liberalizing trade, not collapsing or not being affected uh, by those things. I don't, I don't think at this point in time there is any immediate threat. I, don't, I just don't see that. On a trade front or from a trade perspective, um, these things are always very pervasive and you may have different kinds of uh, uh, even geopolitical tensions. Uh, inside and outside um, uh, Europe, um, it's difficult to tell uh, the consequences of that. Uh, but I don't see any immediate and uh, automatic uh, relation uh, between the two things. In the WTO and in Geneva, I have never seen anything that directly links the two. Now, David, for those of you who don't know, he was the NAMA negotiator uh, and services negotiator uh, throughout most of the life of the, of the, uh, of the Doha round. And um, so where we are is also due to him. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say, I have to say, he, he, he was always very, very tough, very difficult, but also constructive. And he, he tried to, to find solutions as well. And I think we're very close in 2008, maybe not as close as we thought, 
but clearly closer than we are today. That's, that's also uh, true. And I think what um, David is referring to is the fact that when we were negotiating those things, uh, the Director General had a very, very remote participation. Uh, it was essentially done by the members themselves. So they sat down and they negotiated. And sometimes, rightly or wrongly, I don't know, they even wanted the DG to be you know, uh, away from this. Um, although, in the end, he always came and, and tried to, to facilitate things. Um, and is it something that um, today we should change or could change? Look, I don't know, uh, David. I think it's, uh, it's the, I'm, I have been doing this long enough, and so have you, to know that um, the dynamics of a negotiation uh, is also very much impacted on the personalities, right? So who the negotiators are is also as important as what the substance is. You, if you have bad chemistry, it's sometimes very difficult. Um, and each, each case is a case. Each moment is a moment. So, for example, in Bali, um, I had to be more involved in the final stretch. If I wasn't, then frankly, it wouldn't happen because there was no, no conducting, there is no, no thread, uh, you know, pulling those things together. And I think that members, at, at a certain point in time, they needed to blame it on somebody else. Okay, so I was it, <laughs> all right? So I had to be there. If it works, fine. If it doesn't work, blame it on me. Um, you go to your capital and say this proposal was made by this crazy director general. You know, I have nothing to do with it. I hate this, but uh, this is what, it, what we have, so let's go with it. And they would never accept that they were part of that, uh, you know, give and take. Uh, in that situation, it worked. Um, now, uh, I have been trying, you know, you know, a lot of the proposals that are on the table came, came from not from the negotiators, because no one wanted to put anything on the table and have their fingerprints associated with that. Mm. So we had to be bolder and put some ideas. Look, what about this? And what about that? And uh, well, um, sometimes it was well received. Sometimes it was immediately shot down by one or two. But that's, you know, during the rain, you get wet. Uh, but that's fine. I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with getting wet, you know. Um, but it depends on the negotiation. It depends on the moment of the negotiation. I think members are not um, uh, strongly attached to a particular format or a particular role of the DG or of the secretariat. I think it depends. It depends on the moment. It depends on the issue. It depends on whether for that particular issue, they trust you, or whether for that particular issue, they don't trust you. And then if they don't trust you, you'd better stay away. You know, don't even try. Um, but if for a particular negotiation, a particular issue, they think uh, that uh, you were helpful, and you know when they think that you, that you have a role to play. You know, they come to you and they say, do something. You know, and then, then you do. Now, sometimes they say, DG, you better not... Um, <laughs> mess with this, then you don't. You know, you, you, what you cannot do is impose yourself and try to do what they don't want you to do. And um, so I'm open-minded. I do, I help where I think I can or where I think I should, where I think the, the, the help is going to be um, uh, useful, where I think they, sometimes you think that they need, to go, that they, they need to go at each other first. Sometimes they say, put something. I said, no, I'm not putting anything. You guys fight. You know, bleed yourselves to death. And when you really don't have anywhere to go, which happened with ITA? Which happened with ITA? I was not involved with ITA at all. At all. They were negotiating by themselves and doing things by themselves. When they really had a mess in their hands, that they couldn't go anywhere, then they said, well, let's, help the, let's ask the DG to help. Right? Uh, and then you do. You know, do your best to, to finalize the thing. But I don't think, I think going back to your question, I don't think that uh, 
today they 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 are attached to any particular kind of uh, of role uh, or any particular type of way to negotiate. I think in that sense we have more flexibility. There's more. The only cardinal sin, and I think, in any process with DG, without DG, with secretariat, without secretariat, is transparency and inclusiveness. If you try to impose things on them, then you have a problem. They're okay if they're not in the room uh, negotiating because they understand that sometimes the give and take has to be confidential, just a few, et cetera, et cetera. But they need to know what went on in the room and they need to have an opportunity to, to, to comment on what happened there. That, I think, is the cardinal principle. They all need to know, they may not like what they're signing on to, but they have to know why they're signing them, why that particular comma has been placed at that place. And that, I think, is, the, is what you have to be very, very mindful. You can do whatever you want, but don't do it behind their backs. Be transparent and be ready to be accountable. That's all. Director General, this has been very good. In fact, it's excellent, extremely candid. The Director General has a schedule which is as busy as the Pope's. So unfortunately, I can't take your question, Mike. We promised we'd get him out 10 minutes earlier than now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all.